after the semester. Uh, last lecture until August. Uh, we we're talking about the atypical antidepressants. Um, you know, if you're going to really get into this game, uh, you really don't need to understand the dosages or, or any of the rest of it. I mean, there are always doctors around that are, are the ones that are going to be uh, uh, prescribing these medications. But what you're going to—the reason you need that we need this lecture is because you're going to be hearing all these words, uh, and and actually. They, they keep coming up with new ones all the time. Uh, if you watch television, um, then we see these advertisements, Cymbalta especially, is, uh, is uh, a very common one. Uh, Effexor, my wife's on Effexor. But you're going to hear these words, and you need to know what they are and, and what they do, uh, potentially, so that uh, when they say, you know, my doctor put me on Effexor, and I have no idea if it's a, is, is it an antidepressant or is it an anti-anxiety drug? And the reality is, it's both, and it works that way. No, you're fine. Don't worry about it. <laughs> anyway, so these these are the atypical antidepressants. We're going to talk about tricyclics. We're going to talk about monoamine oxidase inhibitors. We've already talked about talked about SSRIs, and the reason we talked about them first is because that's what everybody's treating people with right now. Uh, the, the atypical antidepressants. Uh, not only work on serotonin, but the, it also works on norepinephrine. <clears throat> so it not only makes you not depressed anymore, but it raises your feeling of well-being. It, it, uh, that's what norepinephrine does. Uh, really kind of fascinating. Uh, so we're talking about the anti, uh, atypical antidepressants. Uh, Effexor is one of them. Uh, Cymbalta is another one. Vinlafaxine and dulo, dulo, duloxetine, <laughs> Cymbalta and Effexor. They're both serotonin and norepinephrine reuptake inhibitors. Uh, this seems to be the direction that a lot of doctors are going now. Uh, so instead of uh, just an SSRI, now they have an SNRI. Uh, so uh, you may see this a lot more uh, in the future. As a matter of fact, we may, uh, we may lose all of our SSRIs. Uh, people will stop, stop using them because uh, there is a problem. <coughs> uh, the pr problem has to do with uh, uh, sexual response. It lowers your sexual response. And most people don't like that. Uh, they don't want that at all. Uh, Rimuron has uh, serotonin sub subtype and norepinephrine activity. Uh, and that's uh, tazepine. Uh, trazodone and nefazodone. Uh, have different uh, serotonin activity than SSRI. Uh, trazodone, of course, is the drug that we were giving to the uh, guy suffering from PTSD. Uh, now the people are coming back from Afghanistan and Iraq. We're giving them the same stuff. Uh, if they are having, uh, if they have insomnia, uh, usually uh, the human body. You got to remember that the human body wants to be normal and wants everything to be okay. Uh, so one of the things that is happening. Uh, is that these individuals, they're having these intrusive dreams. Uh, and because they're having intrusive dreams, they try not to go to sleep. Uh, so they'll stay up, uh, or they'll get, they'll get so snockered that, uh, that they, don't, they don't dream, uh, that they're uh, out of their minds. Or they'll take drugs uh, so that they don't think about the drugs. So they develop this, this really strange insomnia uh, that takes place. Uh, well, what we treat them with is Desiril or Trazodone. Uh, and what this stuff does, uh, it uh, jumps them uh, across the delta wave sleep cycle and it throws them into REM sleep almost immediately. Now the reason that that's, that's good is because uh, the uh, delta wave sleep is when you are dreaming of your intrusive dreams. Uh, the REM sleep, uh, just as you can remember, if you can remember the dream you had last night or when you just woke up, you're, trying to, you're remembering the dream that you had. Uh, it was kind of a fantastic dream. It didn't have anything to do with reality. Uh, that's REM sleep dream. But the uh, delta wave sleep dream uh, tends to be something that ha is happening to you right now or has happened to you in the past. Anyway, so that's uh, the way Trazodone and Desiril works. Well, Butrin uh, has a dopamine and norepinephrine activity. Uh, doesn't really do anything to uh, serotonin, and for that reason, it makes you, uh, it gives you a blast, uh, and it raises your 
feeling of well-being, but it really doesn't raise your serotonin level. And because of that, the happiness factor is not really uh, factored in. So Wellbutrin uh, doesn't do anything with uh, serotonin. Okay, all, uh, all of these uh, anti, uh, atypical antidepressants uh, have FDA approval to treat depression. Uh, the SNRIs have been shown to be effective in chronic neuro neuropathic pain. Uh, so somebody who's suffering from uh, neuralgia, uh, somebody that's, that has uh, chron chronic fatigue syndrome, will take an SNRI. Um, bupropion uh, is uh, uh, used as, that's uh, another name for uh, Zyban. Uh, it's uh, used for nicotine addiction. Uh, SNRIs are used to, to augment SSRIs to reduce SSRI uh, sexual side effects. Um, if somebody has uh, insomnia, uh, trazodone of course, uh, many are very similar to SSRIs, uh, but they don't have the sexual side effects. Uh, some of them you can use uh, in place of SSRIs if you're having a, a sexual dysfunction. Uh, these do not have a, a sexual side effect. Uh, uh, bupropion, uh, that's Zyban, uh, mirtazapine, uh, trazodone, and nephazodone. Nephazodone, of course, is... Uh, who makes up these words? I know, who makes up these names. Actually, they have to do with uh, the chemical structure. Yeah. Uh, and the chemical name is like three times as long, and this is in there some books. Mm -hmm. yeah. And so they'll come up with a chemical, this is the uh, chemical name, um, the official chemical name is, has, you know, it's this long. And then they come up with a, uh, something that they can market this by, Symbolta or Effexor or whatever, exactly. Effexor is similar to the tricyclics with less safety and side effect concerns. So uh, we're gonna talk about the tricyclics. Uh, the first uh, drugs that were, were the first antidepressants that were uh, developed were monoamine oxidase inhibitors. Uh, and the tricyclics were second. Uh, the FDA approved for a depression and generalized anxiety disorder, so, uh, social anxiety disorder. Uh, of course, I told you that my wife took uh, Tate's uh, effects from now. Um, she was depressed because I was gone for six weeks during the summertime. Uh, she was having anxiety attacks. Uh, she was worried about somebody seducing me, I guess. Um, really kind of interesting. I, I, <laughs> when she was... When she was the colonel, when she was still in the military, she didn't have these problems. And then uh, once she got out of the military, I, fig I guess she figured I'd, I'd wander off with some other hot lady, or maybe not even a hot lady, I don't know. <laughs> I have no idea what was going on. Anyway, so uh, when I came back, uh, she was on Effexor. Uh, changed a lot of different things. Uh, it changed the way she thought about things. And she couldn't think as deeply about things, and that was really kind of, kind of uh, irritating because she'd always been a really strong lady. Mm. Uh, SNRI activity depends on on the dosage. Uh, Effexor, of course, uh, comes in uh, three different uh, three different levels. It has minimal. Uh, uh, Effexor has a minimal uh, drug interaction. Uh, side effects uh, with missed doses, and that's what my wife has discovered. Uh, she can't really forget her effects uh, her pill because when she does, she she throws up, and uh, that tells her right away that uh, oops, I forgot a pill. Cymbalta is uh, SNRI profile minimally uh, dose dependent. It's indicated for depression and chronic neuropathic pain. Uh, Cymbalta, and of course we see this on television with individuals suffering from bipolar disorder. Uh, Cymbalta is the drug of choice uh, as, the, uh, as the extra drug to, to make them feel better. Uh, Wellbutrin or Zyban, Zyban and, and Wellbutrin are actually the same thing, it's just a, a different dosage. Uh, it's dop uh, it has to do with dopamine reuptake and inhibition, so it leaves dop more dopamine in your uh, synaptic clefts. Uh, as we know, dopamine is very important as far as the dopamine loop is concerned. This is why people gamble. This is why people uh, take drugs. Uh, Zyban, of course, is used for smoking addiction. Um, there are seizure risks uh, for certain patients. 
Uh, I keep talking about this. Um, you know, not everybody's the same, and potentially, like my brother and me, I, you know, we were we were born of the same father. We had the same mother. Uh, yet uh, he's so sensitive to caffeine that he goes berserk if he drinks caffeine. And me, I can drink all the caffeine in the world. It doesn't make any difference to me. Um, so uh, the reality is that uh, that. Uh, <coughs> And it doesn't have anything to do, obviously, it doesn't have anything to do with race. Otherwise, you know, my brother and I are obviously the same race. Uh, so it doesn't have anything to do with race. It just has to do with your biochemical makeup. Uh, so there are a lot of people that are different. And we need to understand that. Uh, I mean, how many people in the world are, are insensitive to opioids? Well, in some countries, it's up to 10%. Uh, I'm not sensitive to opioids, but almost everybody else is, and of course that's the reason why we're having the uh, opiate opioid crisis in the United States, because they really react to this stuff. So the reality is that there are, are, are different, there are people out there that are different than we are, and that's one of the things we need to remember about dosages. A lot of times doctors will not pay attention to their, their patients. Uh, they don't listen to them. Uh, they just, uh, they try to do the same thing, they assume everybody's exactly the same. And this is something that we need to remember, because the reality is that everybody is, uh, some, to some degree, they're different. Uh, if we were, if we all had uh, the flu, no, let's, let's get something else. If we all had beta strep, strep, uh, strep drip, uh, and we all took the, an antibiotic to, to fight the strep drip. It would probably work on all three of us, I'm guessing, unless you're sensitive to uh, to penicillin. Uh, people that are allergic to eggs are, are allergic to penicillin as well. Uh, but if you're not allergic to that, uh, of course, this is going to work on you. And that's going to work on 95% of the population. What's the difference between penicillin and amoxicillin? Amoxicillin, uh, penicillin is a specific um, antibiotic. Uh, amoxicillin is also a specific antibiotic, but it has, it's a broader spectrum antibiotic. In other words, it, it kills more, bacteria, more types of bacteria. Uh, initially, we had uh, we had sulfur drugs, we had penicillin, uh, but we had things that killed specific bacteria. Uh, penicillin kills gonorrhea, it kills uh, Staph aureus, it kills uh, beta strip group A. Uh, so we had we had penicillin, and then we had all these other drugs that killed something else. Uh, and then they, they tried, they, they came up with antibiotics that were broader spectrum, that would kill everything. Mm -hmm. um, the, the first uh, broad spectrum antibiotic was actually penicillin. Uh, and also sulfur drugs, uh, because they killed uh, a, a group of uh, bacteria. The problem is, of course, if you take penicillin for beta strip per day, uh, does a good job of killing beta strip per day, does a good job of killing gonorrhea, uh, does a okay job with, with staph aureus. You know, now we got a problem because uh, because the more antibiotics you take, the more uh, more tolerant your bacteria come, becomes to that uh, that antibiotic. I mean, if you have an infection, if you have some penicillin wandering through your system, and uh, you still get an infection with staph aureus, that means that staph aureus isn't affected by that. That kind of mm -hmm. And that's one of the reasons why they kept, they started hitting people with heavier and heavier doses. Um, a lot of times people will take a broad spectrum antibiotic and it will kill all the normal flora in their, in their digestive tract. Now normally you just pick, pick it right back up uh, because they, you've got tons of bacteria uh, and it doesn't kill everything, usually it doesn't kill everything. Uh, so you'll have the squirts for a couple of days and then all of a sudden it'll you know, everything will solidify and you get the problem. But amoxicillin is a broad spectrum of uh, <laughs> And now uh, bacteria are becoming uh, uh, tolerant to amoxicillin. And that's, uh, it doesn't taste very good either. <laughs> so what they'll do, I mean, if you hit, hit your kids with amoxicillin, that's probably the first thing that they will do. They'll try to find a, an antibiotic, a broad spectrum antibiotic that actually works in this bacteria. That way they don't have to worry about it. That way they don't, they don't have to uh, uh, do a culture and do a sensitivity test uh, to find out what will actually kill it. They just use the broad spectrum antibiotic. Uh, but like I said, sometimes we have problems from 
really kind of fascinating, this whole, the whole pharmaceutical thing. Uh, working in the laboratory, one of my jobs was uh, culturing bacteria, uh, trying to find out why the, what kind of ear infection somebody had. Uh, normally when somebody has an ear infection, they hit them with a broad spectrum antibiotic. Uh, but it needs to be more specific because they need to make sure it kills everything. Um, uh, if it's like that Staph aureus, you know, the Staph aureus is already tolerant to the penicillin to some extent, and now, so they have to even more heavier character goes. And of course, uh, the be it's better to uh, treat the, the individual with something that, that destroys all the bacteria without, without any problems. Uh, it gets really kind of interesting. So that was one of the jobs that, that I had, besides collecting urine specimens. <laughs> <laughs> I only did that maybe once or twice a month. I mean, it, it's not like I was doing that every day. Uh, but uh, bacteriology, you know, microbiology was something that I did every day. And chemistry and, and uh, hematology and whatnot. Anyway, okay, so what do we do? We're, we've got well Um So there are some individuals that will have seizures from, uh, from well -butrin. Uh, raising their dopamine level, uh, raising their norepinephrine level will potentially put them into seizure. Uh, there's a potential that there is a drug interaction, uh, except with MAOI. So you can take the SNRIs, most, you can take most of them with, uh, with MAOIs, monoamine oxidase inhibitors. And we're going to talk about the mon. We don't really treat people with monoamine oxidase inhibitors unless the other antidepressants don't work. And, and I'll, I'll explain why in just a second. Uh, Rimeron uh, is a complex uh, serotonin and histamine, uh, has uh, histamine activity. Uh, histamine, uh, of course, uh, if you um, have an infection, if you're allergic to something, and you're, suddenly you get welts all over your body, or uh, suddenly you start sneezing, you can take an antihistamine and knock out the allergy. So histamines are there to, uh, for inflammation purposes. Uh, so uh, Rimeron actually works, it raises your serotonin level, but it also reduces your sensitivity uh, to uh, histamine. It's an antihistamine. Uh, receptor activity changes with changes in dose, of course, sedation and weight gain, and uh, especially at lower doses. Uh, so it puts you to sleep and it uh, makes you gain weight. Uh, which nobody likes. <clears throat> well, some people like it. Uh, lipid abnormalities, uh, it raises your uh, HDL, or your LDL, uh, and it can raise your triglycerides. And this can be a problem if that is a problem that you have. Uh, it doesn't have very much drug interaction except with MAOIs, and it does have a problem with MAOIs. Uh, almost all the atypicals have a problem with MAOIs. I think I said it backwards uh, just a minute ago. They all have interaction with MAOIs. So if you're taking a uh, monoamine oxidase inhibitor, which most people aren't, but if you are, you can't take the uh, VA typicals. You, you have to go off one or the other. And usually what you'll go off of is the monoamine oxidase inhibitors. Uh, Serazone is rarely used to, uh, due to its irreversible liver toxicity. And this is kind of a problem that we have liver toxicity. A lot of these uh, um, SSRIs and SNRIs uh, are toxic to your liver. Liver, they destroy your liver, which is not a good thing. You sent me a, an email asking for a letter of recommendation. Did I ever do that? Uh, yeah. I did? Okay. Because I couldn't remember doing it. Okay. It's, it's been kind of a, a stressful time for the last couple of weeks. So people are sending me requests, and, and I can't remember whether I did it or not. I slept and uh, forgot. So, but I did. I, I did send you a letter. Okay. So what do we have? For, oh, liver toxicity. Uh, especially serazone. Serazone, they thought that serazone was going to be uh, the next Prozac, uh, but then all of a sudden they, they started blowing people's livers out. Uh, when I say people, they're blowing people's livers out, what I really mean is that uh, here all of us are taking serazone, 
Uh, and everybody's okay except Johnny because he's got a really sensitive liver. Uh, and then we've got uh, then we've got me. I drink too much alcohol, so my liver's kind of sensitive too. Uh, so he can't take it, and I can't take it. But everybody else is okay. I can't take it because I'm, I'm an alcoholic, and he can't take it because he's got a sensitive liver. And, and that's just the way things work. Um, uh, the other problem is, here I am, I'm, I'm this white guy that's, uh, that's a heavy drinker, and I've got no problem whatsoever, except I can't take it. And he, he can't take it because he's got a sensitive liver, but if he ever starts drinking, he's a dead man, because his liver is so sensitive. And of course, you know, there are different people that have this problem. Uh, you may know somebody that uh, started drinking and they were dead in like 15 years from, from uh, drinking alcohol. Whereas you can watch other people, they've been alcoholics for 30 or 40 years, and they're, they barely have a, a, a non-functional liver at all. At all. It all depends on their sensitivity. Uh, so they pulled it from the market, but they only pulled it from the market in the United States. Uh, the problem is that if you go to, to uh, Tunisia or you go to Turkey, uh, you know, you can get to Sarazone. As a matter of fact, if you complain about uh, being depressed there, uh, they won't sell you Prozac because it's too expensive, but they've got all the Sarazone in the world. Uh, they are Turks, therefore they don't have a, a reactivity uh, to this stuff. So they, it's on the market over there. So if you go over there, you may be able to get Sarazone. And it may work for you or it may kill you. Uh, that's that's the choice. Uh, so anytime you go overseas, you've got to be really careful about what uh, medications they're giving you. Uh, the United States has decided that it's too dangerous, uh, but in other countries, of course, they have different criteria. Um, Sarazone works. It really does work. And like I said, Johnny and I can't take it, but the rest of you guys are going to be fine with it. And it works very, very well. Uh, it was supposed to, to uh, replace... Uh, uh, and, and the reason it works so well is because it really raises your norepinephrine level and makes you feel like you can conquer the world. So people take it and they feel really good. Uh, so that's one of the reasons why, uh, why it's, it's legal in some places and illegal in others. Uh, Desiril, uh, <laughs> uh, if, if you think of all the Vietnam vets that you can remember, the one, especially the ones with, uh, with uh, PTSD, uh, one of the problems was that they were sleepy heads. They slept in uh, during the day. They had a hard time getting up uh, in the morning. Uh, they also got fat, and they got fat fairly quickly. And the reason is because they were taking Desiree. We didn't realize at the time that we were making these people not only sedentary, but we were also making them portly. Uh, but if you think about all the Vietnam vets that you know, uh, if you look at them, you can see, geez, this guy gained a lot of weight after he came back from Vietnam. You look at a picture of him when he was in the military, when he was over in Vietnam, skinny as a minute, came back to the States, started suffering from PTSD, they hit him with Desiril, and all of a sudden he turned into a tub, turned into a, a tubby guy. Uh, we saw this over and over and over again. Uh, the other problem with Desiril is that uh, if you don't have a normal to high blood pressure, uh, then it can potentially make your blood pressure uh, so low that you have a problem. Uh, it's used for insomnia, as I said before. Uh, rare reports of sustained painful erection, this is known as priap priapism, which they didn't really mind all that much. The problem is if you maintain an erection, you know, they tell you uh, if you watch the Viagra commercials or the Cialis commercials or the Levitra, I don't think they have a Levitra commercials. Anyway, they tell you if you have an erection for longer than four hours uh, that you need to go to, to see a doctor because the problem is uh, when you stress those, uh, uh, all an erection is, is uh, engorged uh, blood vessels. Uh, but if you keep those uh, blood vessels engorged for a number of hours, uh, then it can potentially destroy the blood vessel. Uh, and of course, you won't be able to have a, an erection anymore. And of course, that's... That's known as priapism. And this was a side effect of, uh, of Desiril. And a lot of these guys, they would, uh, something would happen and they'd get an erection and they, it wouldn't go down. They're too embarrassed to say anything about it. Uh, so they would uh, they'd lose their, their ability to uh, have sex. 
Didn't happen with everybody, it only happened every once in a while. <laughs> uh, I can remember a couple cases they came into the emergency room. Uh, and of course, well, it was, it was embarrassing for them, uh, as you can imagine. Uh, the tricyclics, uh, in 1958, it, they were looking for an a, uh, antipsychotic. Uh, they came up with amipramine. Uh, amipramine, uh, they found out it was a very poor antipsychotic, but it worked as an antidepressant. And that was the beginning of the tricyclics. Uh, the tricyclics are all about the same uh, chemical structure. There's amipramine and nortriptyline and any iptamine. Uh, or I mean uh, is, is probably a tricyclic. Um, in the 1960s, uh, they started using tricyclics uh, to replace monoamine oxidase inhibitors. Uh, it became the drug of choice in the 1960s. Um, so for about 30 years, the tricyclics were very popular. Uh, the problem was that uh, there was uh, liver toxicity that we saw with, with select individuals, uh, and for that reason, uh, we don't uh, don't use it as much. As soon as the SSRIs came out, uh, we started using those because there were fewer side effects uh, than there were with monoamine oxidase inhibitors and tricyclics. Uh, so what does it do? Uh, it raises your norepinephrine level. It uh, it raises your serotonin level. It acts as an antihistamine. Uh, it's uh, we. Uh, muscarinic and alpha adrenergic receptor activity uh, as well. Uh, and of course, it all depends on, on how much you're taking. Uh, anticholinergic activity leads to many of the side effects of these drugs. And for that reason, uh, people don't like to take uh, tricyclics as much as they like to take uh, some of the other drugs. Um, depression and, and similar spectrum with disorders as SSRIs. Uh, especially helpful with chronic pain and depression, secondary to medical conditions such as AIDS. Uh, so tricyclics are now being used much more than it was in the past uh, due to all the people suffering from AIDS. We uh, auto almost automatically start giving them tricyclics. Uh, it's used for individuals that wet the bed. Uh, it's used for uh, narcolepsy. Uh, it's used for men who are suffering from premature ejaculation. Uh, that's used for insomnia, it's used for, for migraine prophylaxis. In other words, they'll take the tricyclics, uh, hoping that it will, uh, will keep the person from having migraine headaches. Uh, and they, they will put them on a maintenance level of tricyclic drugs. Uh, the problem is, of course, it has liver toxicity, uh, so one of the things you have to do is draw their blood on a relatively regular basis uh, to make sure they've got a proper level in there. Uh, there are multiple significant interactions uh, with other drugs, um, and some of them can have serious consequences, of, of course. Uh, so the problem with tricyclics mainly is that uh, you can't take other drugs with tricyclics. You have to be very, very careful if you're on any other medications. The side effects, anticholinergic uh, side effects, include dry mouth constipation, blurred vision, and urinary retention. Uh, if you watch television, they have drugs that make you pee. They're not diuretics. Uh, they are drugs that allow you to urinate if you can't urinate. Uh, if this is a male, uh, their problem is the urinary retention and their bladder will expand uh, markedly before they can actually uh, urinate. Uh, cardiac arrhythmias and, and conduction changes, so orthostatic hypotension, once again you have low blood pressure, uh, it sedates you, you feel dulled if you take this stuff, and it makes you gain weight. Uh, problems, uh, if you overdose with this stuff, you kill yourself. Uh, it's not like SSRIs, you take Prozac. If you overdose on Prozac, nothing's going to happen. Well, well something is going to happen. You're not going to kill yourself. But if you overdose on this stuff, uh, you can't remember whether you took a pill, so you take another pill. Uh, and then you take a, a pill a couple hours later, you're dead. You're just dead. Uh, and the reason is because of your blood pressure. Your blood pressure goes down to nothing, and you just curve. Patients with bipolar disorder may uh, be pushed into mania or rapid cycling. And for that reason, we don't use it to treat the depressive symptoms of bipolar disorder.
Remember that amipramine was discovered in 1958, 1959. Um, monoamine oxidase inhibitors, they actually weren't looking for an antidepressant. They were looking for an anti-tuberculosis drug, and they found monoamine oxidase inhibitors instead. Uh, real problem with this, uh, this is known as serendipity, where they're looking for one thing and they find something else. So both tricyclics and monoamine oxidase inhibitors were discovered when they were looking for something else, and that's known as serendipity. Um, so they started using it as an antidepressant. Everybody was really happy. Then all of a sudden, in 1962, <clears throat> they discovered that uh, sometimes if you don't control your diet and you're on monoamine oxidase inhibitors, uh, the individual will... Uh, uh, their blood pressure will skyrocket all, just all of a sudden. Uh, they, they will get uh, extremely hot uh, to the point of uh, beyond a fever, and it, it kills them. It, they cook themselves to that. Really kind of odd. This was discovered in 1962. Actually, they started seeing um, dietary uh, problems in the, 19, in the early 1960s, before 1962. Uh, nobody was smart enough to figure it out until 62. I mean, obviously they had other drug pro or, uh, uh, dietary problems before, but nobody noticed it until the 60s. Uh, what they discovered was anything with tyramine in it uh, caused an interaction with the MAOIs. And I'll talk about the tyramines in just a sec. Excuse me, just a second. Um, the 1960s, significant reduction in use due to an inter introduction of the tyramines. Uh, which do not have a severe restrictions of MAOIs. Uh, transdermal cell cell uh, patch MSAM uh, to treat depression, and this was discovered in 2006. Uh, or 2006. For the longest time, we weren't using monoamine oxidase inhibitors, uh, and then they came up with this transdermal patch. Well, we don't have a Prozac transdermal patch. We don't have a tricyclic transdermal patch, uh, but we do have a monoamine oxidase inhibitor transdermal patch that works very, very well. People like it because they can, they can just stick it on and then they don't have to worry about it anymore. Uh, and that was in 2006. So all of a sudden we've got people on MAOIs again. Uh, and that's one of the reasons why if you watch a commercial and they're talking about Cymbalta or they're talking about uh, Zyban or, or uh, what's the other anti-smoking drug. Anyway, they tell you you can't, if you're on MAOIs, you can't, uh, t you can't use this drug or you need to tell your doctor. Uh, the reality is if you try to use this drug with, with, the, uh, with the patch, uh, that's the only MAOIs that people are taking now, uh, you'll, you'll kill yourself. I mean, it, 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 it will kill you. Uh, your blood pressure will skyrocket and you'll die. I mean, it's just the way it works. Uh, effective antidepressants for those who uh, can adhere to the necessary restrictions and tolerate many of the other side effects. And there are tons of side effects with the MAOIs. Uh, very long duration requiring caution when mixing with restricted substances or medications. Uh, some of these uh, restrictions, the, these tyramine foods, uh, some of these you can use to a minor extent. And of course, this is the problem. Uh, you can eat cheese. Uh, and it's not going to kill you, uh, but if you eat too much cheese, now all of a sudden we've got a, we've got a reaction. Uh, so most people just stay away from all of these tyramines. Uh, the tyramines include cheeses, chocolate, soybeans, hot dogs, any processed meat. So you can't eat lunch meat. Uh, you can't eat any dried sausage, so no jerky. Uh, caffeine, uh, you can't <laughs> drink any caffeine, but you also can't drink beer and wine. Yeah, I know. I look Everybody's favorite stuff. The, the part that drives everybody nuts is the fact you can't eat olives and you can't eat pickles. Anything that is, uh, is processed, uh, you can't eat. But you can eat some things, like you can eat five olives, but if you eat that sixth olive, you're a dead man. I mean, it's just bizarre. And people, and I know Johnny thinks this is funny, but I mean, people will push the envelope as far as they possibly can. They, so they'll eat five olives, both green and black? Both green and black, they both have tyramine in it because that's what they process it with. 
Uh, it has to do with the uh, uh, turmeric acid, if they use turmeric acid uh, to, uh, pro to uh, you know, process their olives or whatever. Or the pickles, you know, if they can eat sweet pickles, but they can't eat dill pickles, you know, what's that all about? And you can eat a pickle, but you can't eat that second, you can't take a bite off that second one. I mean, that's this crazy stuff. And people will push the envelope just to find out where they're going to start dying. You know, it's really kind of bizarre. Of course, these people are depressed anyway. <clears throat> and they're taking the drugs because of that. Um, there are multiple prescribed and over-the-counter medications that can be potentially lethal, and this is a problem. I mean, you've got a cold, so somebody gives you a, or you've got uh, allergies, so they give you a Claritin, and the next thing you know, you're, you're having seizures and you're in the emergency room. Uh, it also causes ser uh, serotonin syndrome with SSRIs and many others, so monoamine oxidase inhibitors are really dangerous. And as I said, we, we had gone, we had moved completely away from them. Then in 2006, they had, they, they discovered the, or they developed the transdermal patch and uh, everything changed. So when we're talking about uh, monoamine oxidase inhibitors, what are we talking about? Well, we're primarily talking about Nardil, Marplan, and Carnate. And probably you've never heard of these drugs before. They don't advertise them. Uh, MSOM, of course, is, uh, is in the transdermal patch. Uh, Eldapril, uh, selegiline, uh, is used for Parkinson's disease. Uh, so somebody with Parkinson's disease, they can't eat pickles. What's that all about? You know, that doesn't seem right. They can't have a beer. Uh, they can't eat jerky. Uh, if they go to a picnic, they can't have hot dogs. You know, what's going on? Uh, so they have to be really, really, really careful as to what they ingest. Uh, okay, so that's the um, monoamine oxidase inhibitors. Uh, the mood stabilizers are used to treat bipolar disorder. Many mood stabilizers are used to treat various seizure disorder types, migraines, chronic pain syndromes, aggression, impulsivity, augmentation of antidepressants and antipsychotics. Uh, so a lot of times we'll give this to people that are having psychotic symptoms or depressive symptoms, and we'll use the mood suit sim, uh, the stabilizers to potentially stabilize their mood, of course. Other classes of meds are also used in bipolar treatment, usually in combination with mood stabilizers. Um, uh, the, the biggest problem that we have is that we're not really treating the, the depression, we're trying to treat the mania. It's the mania that makes you bipolar, it's not the depression. If you're just depressed, then you have a major depressive disorder. Uh, and we treat you differently. But if you have a manic episode, now you've got bipolar disorder, and we have to uh, try to control your, um, your mania. Now you have bipolar disorder. Uh, so we'll put you on something that tries to keep you from having any manic episodes, and that's known as prophylaxis, of course. When I was a kid, we used to call uh, rubbers. Do you know what rubbers are? You have no idea? Condoms? Okay. <laughs> we used to call them prophylactics. I know, I know. We had all kinds of names for, for condoms. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But that was the medical term, was prophylactics. I don't know where condoms came from. It's, relatively new. it's a relatively new term. Uh, the major mood stabilizers that we use are anticonvulsants and lithium. Lithium is not an anticonvulsant, uh, but we discovered that it actually works on bipolar disorder. Um, it was, and actually it was discovered in 1949, so it's relatively old. It's as old as I am. I was born in 1949, and lithium was discovered as an anti-manic uh, uh, medication in 1949. Um, the problem with lithium, of course, is that it is toxic. Uh, at first they thought, <laughs> I know this sounds stupid. Uh, so if you, if you eat salt, of course, it's sodium chloride. Uh, so what they, they realized, well, we could just put lithium in salt, and instead of sodium chloride, we can make lithium chloride. It tastes exactly the same, and we'll be controlling everybody's uh, manic episodes. We'll keep people, we'll, we'll cure all these bipolar people. 
by the manic depressive at the time because so they thought that they could do that. What they discovered was lithium is a, is a heavy metal, just like sodium is a heavy metal. But lithium is a little bit more difficult to process out of your system. So they started giving lithium toxicity. This is how stupid people are. I hate to tell you how stupid people are, but this is it. They, put, they started putting lithium salt in, in, in salt. They started making salt out of lithium. Anyway, uh, it was less expensive than sodium chloride, as it turns out. And, uh, well, anyway, they discovered that it was toxic. In 1966, French researchers demonstrated that valproate's uh, efficacy in treating mania. Uh, so we started using, uh, so we had lithium. And we had lithium from 1949 to 1966. It was the only treatment for uh, bipolar disorder. Then in 1966, they discovered that valproate uh, actually worked on mania as well. 1978, uh, significant studies demonstrated that lithium's efficacy in bipolar disorder, so we knew that it worked. The problem is, of course, that you can develop a toxic level in your system. Uh, so if somebody's on lithium carbonate, uh, one of the things that we have to do is draw their blood on a relatively frequent basis, uh, potentially a month, uh, maybe every quarter, uh, to make sure they're not, uh, they're not uh, accumulating a toxic level in their system. 19, uh, 1980 studies demonstrated the effectiveness of carbamazepine as a bipolar disorder uh, to treat bipolar disorder. So now all of a sudden we've got the two anticonvulsants, valproate and carbamazepine, uh, as anticonvulsants. So if somebody has epilepsy, we treat them either, well, usually we treat them with more than one, but we treat them with an anticonvulsant, but that's usually carbamazepine or valproate, valproic acid, what we used to call valproic acid. Valproate is, is actually the same stuff. Uh, features of lithium, the only mood stabilizer without significant anticonvulsant properties is lithium. But of course, lithium is a heavy metal and lithium is, can be toxic. Um, it works on just about everybody. 70% uh, response rate to lithium. Uh, it's demonstrating effectiveness is reducing suicidality. And of course, the biggest problem with people with bipolar disorder is that they kill themselves. Uh, they don't stay on their medication, and while they're in a depressive phase, uh, they, they off themselves. Uh, very frequently, unfortunately. Schizophrenics will commit suicide, but by people with bipolar disorder commit suicide at a really high rate. Uh, it's less effective in rapid cycling and mixed bipolar states. Uh, full clinical effect may take up to one to two months, uh, so you have to build a level up in your system. Uh, it's, excreted, it's excreted through your kidneys, just like salt. It, it is a salt. It's, it is a heavy metal. So it's excreted through your kidneys, just like salt is. Uh, minimal liver uh, mediated drug-to-drug uh, -drug interactions, and uh, that is a positive as far as lithium is concerned. Um, it causes fine tremors. So these individuals have a little bit of a shake, just a little bit of a shake. Uh, makes you gain weight, and nobody likes that. It also can make you vomit your dinner. Uh, usually if you're gonna vomit, you vomit in the afternoon. Uh, makes you thirsty, and it increases your urination. It uh, has more severe toxicity, uh, include uh, coarse tremors, gait instability, vomiting, diarrhea, and confusion. Uh, that's with select individuals, as, as I keep saying, everybody has their own biochemical structure. Uh, it's in increased uh, risk of toxicity with fluid or salt restrictions. Uh, hot weather will cause these individuals to go into seizures, potentially. Uh, if they use anti-inflammatory drugs, uh, they may have a problem. Um, uh, ACE inhibitors and an angiotensin uh, receptor blockers can cause problems. These are for blood pressure, these control blood pressure, and of course diuretics uh, that pull uh, water out of your system will also make these individuals go into seizures. Uh, because there's so much uh, kidney interaction, you have to draw um, kidney functions, creatinine and BUN are both, uh, blood, urea, nitrogen are both uh, kidney functions. Uh, so we have to, make, uh, we have to draw those, uh, those specimens from time to time. Uh, we have to check the uh, thyroid. 
Uh, females especially have a problem with uh, lithium uh, related thyroid dysfunction. Of course, your thyroid has to do with your metabolism. Now we got a really serious problem. Uh, another name for carbamazepine is Tegretol. Um, if you know anybody with epilepsy, they probably are on Tegretol or Depakote. Um, carbamazepine is used as an acute mania and bipolar, in, uh, bipolar maintenance. Uh, it works very, very well. Strangely enough, it works very, very well. Uh, more effective, it's more effective uh, than lithium in rapid cycling and mixed states. Uh, it's less effective in bipolar-related depression. Uh, remember, this is an anticonvulsant. It's not an antidepressant. Uh, therefore, it really doesn't work on depression, but it does work on the mania. Multiple significant drug-to-drug -drug interactions affecting both other medications. Uh, sometimes it reduces their level and sometimes it raises their, their level. Uh, strangely enough, when you, uh, when you give, uh, give it with uh, valproic acid uh, or valproate, uh, it will increase the uh, carbamazepine level. So if you give them two anticonvulsants, which is relatively common, uh, you, you have to be very careful of the dosage because it actually uh, has a synergistic effect where it actually multiplies it rather than adds it, uh, the effect. It induces its own metabolism, so it may need to adjust uh, dose over several weeks, uh, so that can be a problem as well. Uh, and of course, one of the things that you have to do when you give somebody carbamazepine is that you have to make sure that the level isn't getting toxic. Uh, and the reason is because, well, you know, if all of us were on carbamazepine, uh, since I'm old, older than dirt, uh, my, my metabolism of carbamazepine would be completely different from yours. It doesn't have anything to do with race. It has to do with activity level. It has to do with uh, muscle mass. It has to do with, it's just like alcohol. It has to do with all those things. Uh, and on a day like today, as I said yesterday, I mean, we, the barometric pressure yesterday was really low. It still is relatively low. We still have a, uh, a low uh, moving through, and that's why we have all the rain and snow and sleet and all kinds of odd things. This will change your medication. Uh, so this is something that you need to remember, that uh, on, on foggy days, on, on cloudy days, when it's going to rain, you're going to have a different reaction from your medication. So if all of a sudden you get depressed, or something else happens to you, you get irritated or irritable. Of course, the weather makes you irritable, may make you irritable, but it also may be your medication. Uh, so one of the things that you need to do, I'm not saying, you know, only take half a pill today. That doesn't make any sense. Uh, but what you need to do is understand that you may have a reaction to it. Uh, you know, uh, Armis wants to drink a bottle of whiskey today. Uh, she's going to get drunk faster. She just needs to remember that. Okay? She's to have <laughs> you think I'll just go down and have a couple beers, and all of a sudden you drink those two beers and you're just on the floor. <laughs> uh, and it's because it's a cloudy day. <clears throat> on a sunny day, you go drink the same. Armis doesn't drink. I'm just teasing you. What? Uh, Cool. Anyway, and this is just something that you need to remember. That you're going to have uh, have a reaction. Uh, the amount of stress that you're under. It's the end of the semester. You know, you guys are trying to finish all of Christine's crap. My God. What did Denise say the other day? 57 pages? She turned in 57 pages for Christine. My God. Who makes you do that kind of stuff? Uh, that kind of stress can change your reaction to all your medications. Or it can change your reaction to anything that happens next. So this is something that you need to remember. Uh, uh, Carbamazepine, uh, the side effects, uh, <laughs> nausea, constipation, and diarrhea, which doesn't make any sense. I mean, either you're constipated or you've got diarrhea, right? It's not like you can have both of them at the same time. Uh, you lose your appetite sometimes. Uh, central nervous system, sedation, dizziness, unsteadiness, uh, potential confusion. Uh, benign rashes are common, but there are some individuals that have, uh, have very sensitive skin and they will have catastrophic rashes. In other words, it, it, uh, uh, they get a rash 
uh, where their skin actually breaks open, they start bleed or bleeding or pus starts coming out, uh, they get infected, now we've got a really serious problem. So if somebody already has psoriasis or, uh, or, or any other skin problem, uh, potentially taking carbamazepine will, will, can potentially kill them. Uh, it may reduce your sodium levels, uh, and this is known as hyponatremia. Uh, liver function abnormalities are rare, but it's possible that uh, it will affect your liver. Uh, toxic metabolite can create problems uh, with drug interactions, especially uh, the other anticonvulsants like valproate, uh, lamotrigine, and phenobarbital, of course, is an anti-seizure uh, medication. But well, we used to give it to people for as uh, as an anti-epileptic. Uh, it's independent of carbamazepine oil and can be checked separately. Of course, you need to check all of these other drugs at the same time. Valproic acid is also called valproate or Depakote. Uh, if you know anybody with uh, with epilepsy, they either take Tegretol or Depakote, probably. Uh, it can be dosed rapidly to treat acute mania, and of course this is one of the things, if you come into the emergency room with a manic episode, they'll shoot you up with this stuff. They'll, they'll hit you with Depakote. It's more effective than lithium in rapid cycling in mixed states. It's used uh, by some to treat aggression and impulsivity in other psychiatric disorders. Uh, so if somebody is overly aggressive or somebody uh, does all kinds of goofy things, just off the top of their head, they'll hit them with this stuff and, and sometimes it'll go away. Um, we can use Depakote as a uh, prophylactic for migraine headaches. It's commonly used at uh, top or above levels, uh, stated for seizure control. Uh, seizure control is, is normally, a, I'm, I'm not really sure what the uh, dosage is, but they'll double the dosage trying to control uh, bipolar symptoms. Uh, some suggest supplementation with carnitine, uh, selenium, and others to reduce the side effects. Uh, and those are heavy metals that also work on, well actually, uh, carnitine is an amino acid, selenium is a, is a heavy metal. And it can control the side effects of Depakote. Uh, nausea, weight gain, once again you take uh, anti-convulsant uh, uh, and you're going to gain weight. Uh, ataxia, uh, unsteadiness, uh, causes hair loss, which doesn't make people happy. Uh, it also gives you a, a tremor. Uh, usually it's a fine tremor. Uh, sometimes you'll have liver dysfunctions, uh, you'll have de decreased platelets. And this is known as uh, thrombocytopenia. Cool name, <laughs> thrombocytopenia. I used to look for thrombocytopenia when I did CBCs, of course, we're looking at the number of platelets that people have. Uh, and this can cause a decrease in the number of platelets. Uh, pancreatitis, which will kill you. Uh, um, of course, it's always severe. Once you get pancreatitis, you might as well. Well, you need to do something. You need to change your lifestyle. And if you don't change your lifestyle, you're dead. Uh, if you get pancreatitis from alcoholism, wow. <clears throat> you might as well just dig the hole. Knock the coffin together. If you're Jewish, you can't use nails. Just something to remember. <laughs> uh, polycystic ovary disease suggested uh, by some reports. Ammonia levels can be increased, particularly in those uh, rare individuals with genetic metabolic uh, deficits. So we see these uh, from time to time. Uh, drug, drug to drug interactions by various mechanisms with various other anticonvulsants. Uh, you can't take aspirin while you're on an anticonvulsant uh, because it destroys the effectiveness of the anti-epileptic. Uh, anti uh, therefore, you'll have an epileptic seizure if you take aspirin, as odd as that seems. But people aren't taking aspirin anymore as an anti-inflammatory. They're usually taking ibuprofen or acetaminophen. Now, the problem with acetaminophen is that acetaminophen is very uh, destructive to your liver. Uh, so if you're, you're taking any of these other drugs that are destructive to your liver, you know, Johnny's got a really sensitive liver, so he has to be really careful what he takes. Uh, acetaminophen is something that he can't take. Um, and, and other problems. He probably, probably doesn't have any more sensitive liver. I'm just using him as, a, as an example.
Of course, I'm old, so I have problems with like everything. Uh, Lamatrigine, oxycarbon, carbazepine, and topa, 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 topiramate. topiramate. Uh, Lamatrigine was invented or was discovered in the 1990s. Uh, they, dis they realized that as an anticonvulsant, it actually worked on bipolar disorder. Uh, obviously, it worked on seizures, otherwise, they wouldn't have developed it. Um, it was, uh, it's the newest uh, anticonvulsant out there. Uh, and of course, they were trying to figure out if it worked as a, a mood stabilizer as well. 2003, uh, lamatrigine uh, was approved for bipolar 1 maintenance. In 2003, so you, uh, of the, the anticonvulsants, the three that you will probably hear about are Tegretol, uh, Depakote, or Valpro Valproic Acid, and lamatrigine are the three. Uh, it's also called Lamictal, uh, lamatrigine. Uh, minimally uh, sedating, unlike most other mood stabilizers, it appears to be especially effective in treating uh, bipolar depression, but unproven to treat mania. Uh, early uh, use in an a as an anticonvulsant in children raised concerns about potentially life-threatening rash. Remember, the, 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 this is a problem with the uh, anticonvulsants. They cause rashes. Um, <laughs> The life-threatening rash, they, it's got a name, Stevens-Johnson syndrome. And it's also called toxic epidermal ne necrolysis. Necro means death. So we've got this, this uh, you're taking medication that kills your skin. Is in essence what's going on. Uh, initiating the nitrogen is done very slowly to decrease the rash, rash risk. Uh, so they will raise your dosage very slowly. Of course, as they're raising your dosage, uh, they, your, the anticonvulsant aspect of it isn't working, uh, so you're having uh, epileptic seizures. This is one of the reasons why we have so much trouble with epilepsy. Uh, to keep these individuals from having their rash, uh, we have to uh, increase the dosage very, very slowly. Uh, and this is one of the reasons why people go, dude, you know, we can just control this with smoke or paw. And of course they are right to some extent. And, and we don't have to worry about dosages as far as pot is concerned. Uh, but, you know, these are toxins and these are very uh, difficult to uh, control. Valproate uh, greatly increases lomatrogene levels. On the other hand, <laughs> carbamazepine greatly decreases lomatrogene levels. And normally, if we're treating bipolar disorder, we treat you with more than one, uh, usually carbamazepine and, and uh, valproic acid. Uh, but if you use lamatrigine, uh, you've got to be really, really careful because the valproate will increase. It, it has a synergistic effect, effect on lamatrigine, and carbamazepine has an antagonistic effect on lamatrigine. Treleptol uh, is another drug, oxcarbazepine. Oxcarba it's another mood stabilizer. It's a brand new anticonvulsant. Uh, it's used primarily in combination with other mood stabilizers, and, but we're not exactly sure if it actually works. It's modified uh, carbamazepine with potentially less side effects and drug-to-drug -drug interaction uh, than, other, than carbamazepine. Uh, so it's just a, a, a different chemical structure. It looks exactly like carbamazepine, except for one tiny little uh, fluctuation, uh, and it uh, has fewer interactions in carbamazepine. Topamax, uh, research questions its use as a mood stabilizer, although scattered reports suggest possible benefits. Uh, the other, everything, all the other anticonvulsants make you gain weight, uh, this stuff makes you lose weight, um, it makes you goofy, it makes you dulls your senses. Uh, it tends to give you kidney stones, and the reason it gives you kidney stones is because it keeps you in a state of uh, dehydration, uh, and for that reason it gives you kidney stones. Uh, it can also give you a metabolic acidosis, which is not a good idea. So Topamax, if anybody offers you Topamax for anything, I would suggest, mm, Let's go with something else. Let's use something else. This one, mm, yeah. 
okay, so you're getting, getting a kickback because you're going to use this stuff, but I'm not getting anything except the headaches and, my, and kidney stones. So no thank you very much. Uh, Kepra, uh, the efficacy of bipolar disorder unsubstantiated through scattered reports suggests possible benefits. Uh, it has minimal drug-to-drug -drug interactions, but we're not exactly sure if it works. Uh, Zonagran, uh, the efficacy of bipolar disorder unsubstantiated, although scattered reports suggest that it might work. Uh, side effects similar to topramate, uh, including weight loss. Okay. okay, let's think about this for a second. So almost all the anticonvulsants make you gain weight. And here we have some anticonvulsants that we're not exactly sure they work, and they make you lose weight. Is that an indicator that it probably doesn't work as an anticonvulsant? Mm -hmm. okay. Doctors are stupid, so you get, you've, got, you're, you've got to be the one to tell them how dumb they are. Symbiax is approved for both bipolar to, uh, to treat bipolar depression. Remember, carbamazepine only works on mania. Valproic acid only works on mania. So if we take uh, sim Symbiax and we take carbamazepine, then we're going to have both of them taken care of. And that's not a bad idea. Okay, let's talk about the older antipsychotics. Chlorpromazine uh, was synthesized as a sedating antihistamine in 1950. Uh, in 1952, it was reported to be beneficial as, a, as an antipsychotic and an anti-mania drug. Uh, 1953, first reports of chlorpromazine uh, associated uh, movement disorders, in other words, cardiac dyskinesia. Uh, 1958, halperidol was, was uh, discovered, or uh, was developed. Uh, so we can see when all of this stuff took place. Uh, the reality is, this is during my lifetime. Uh, 1949, lithium, they discovered lithium working on mania. This is during my lifetime. So all of these drugs, all of, the, all, all of these wonderful things that, that uh, we have now to treat uh, all of these mental disorders, they, have a, they were just discovered within my lifetime. And I'm not quite 70 years old yet. So what was going on before this? The answer is nothing. Those people were going into asylums, and we had no way of treating them. We had no way to let them out of the asylums. Uh, 1962, long-acting injectable uh, fufinazine was developed. 1970, dopamine synthesis of schizophrenia suggested. It wasn't until 1970 that we realized that d dopamine had something to do with schizophrenia. 1970. Uh, so when we talk about this stuff, I mean, I, I was an undergraduate in 1967, graduating from college in 1971. I started in 1967. So if, if, if I am where you guys are today, none of this stuff has been invented yet. So if we look at a, a, an abnormal psychology book from 1967, it looks completely different. We have no drugs to treat anything except lithium to treat bipolar disorder. And that's it. Uh, we've, got, we've got these new drugs, tricyclics and monoamine oxidase inhibitors, to treat depression. What are we going to do with these people? What did we do with these people? We gave them Valium. We gave them Valium. That's all we had. We gave them, gave them phenobarbital. We could sedate them, and that's all we could do. And it, sometimes that worked, and usually it didn't, because they were just as they were. Now they were sleepy and crazy at the same time. Uh, so in 1970, they came up with the dopamine hypothesis for schizophrenia. I graduated from college in 1971. If I talk to my uh, my psychology professor from 1970, and I took psychology in 1970, he didn't even believe this crap. He said, no, that can't be it. We're still not sure where schizophrenia comes from. I mean, it took years for people to, to go, you know, this was probably right. Uh, 2005, the KD trials uh, shows positive outcome for uh, perfenazine uh, compared to newer antipsychotics. Uh, okay. Uh, these, this is uh, um, some uh, grammar. Uh, neuroleptic means uh, seize the neuron. It refers to the tendency to cause stiffness and other neurological, other neurologic symptoms. 
Uh, early methods of dosing would achieve neurolepsis and then back doses down to, uh, to relieve them. So do you understand what I'm saying here? When they use neuroleptics, they put you to a point of seizure and then they would back the dosage down to find out what was the proper dosage. So they would overdose you to begin with. Is that ethical? You might kill this guy just to try to, to, to get them off of, uh, to, to, keep, to control their schizophrenia. That's how they used to do things. As horrible as that sounds. We used to put people in, uh, in diabetic comas and then we would bring them out to, to, to uh, treat insulin. We put them in insulin shock. We throw them in a, 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 a ice bath and their bodies would go into seizure and then their depression would go away. I mean, it's like, we're going to torture you to make your depression go away. I mean, that's where they came up with uh, electroconvulsive therapy. We're going to shock your brain. It's going to hurt so much that when we're done, you're not going to be depressed anymore. That's how much it's going to hurt. Get ready. <laughs> we're, we're about to juice you up. Uh, major tranquilizers are, uh, refers to the tendency to sedate, quiet, and uh, create a blandness in patients uh, similar to the negative symptoms of schizophrenia. Uh, differentiates from the benzodiazepines such as Valium, uh, which were referred to as minor tranquilizers. Uh, in order to control schizophrenia, we used to hit people with Thorazine. Thorazine makes you stupid. It makes you almost non-functional. But we would hit them with this stuff just so that we could control them. And then they came up with the minor tranquilizers. The problem with Valium with benzodiazepines treating psychotic symptoms is that it doesn't do anything to those people. It doesn't sedate them enough. Uh, typical, traditional, conventional antipsychotics differentiate these drugs from newer atypical antipsychotics. Dopamine receptor antagonists uh, highlight strong dopamine activity and tight binding at the D2 receptor site. And of course, that's how we can, can control schizophrenia. The older antipsychotics, uh, extrapyramidal symptoms, um, uh, pyramidal system uh, responsible for voluntary movement. The extrapyramidal system is respons uh, responsible for involuntary muscle action. Uh, it includes dystonias, Parkinsonianism, uh, akathisia, and tardive dyskinesia, uh, acute dystonia, uh, sustained muscular contraction of neck, eyes, and throat, uh, generally occurs soon after starting medication, uh, acute dystonia, I can show you what it looks like. That's what it looks like. You can't relax your neck, you can't relax your jaw. And these people, they, they hit them with this stuff, and they would immediately, immediately go into acute dystonia. And now they can't eat anything for the next two days. Hopefully they came out of it. If they didn't, they died. It was like having lockjaw. So they were putting them in lockjaw. Sometimes it was terminal. Akathisia, uncontrollable continuous motor restlessness, uh, can occur any time in treatment, but generally in the first weeks. Easily misdiagnosed as the underlying psychiatric disorder. If you look at pictures from the old days, sometimes you will see somebody in acute dystonia. And that's what they were hoping for. They used to show doctors, this is what you want your patient to do. Remember, we put them into these, this situation, and then we back them down from their medication. Makes you want to throw up, though. You have to go. I understand. It was nice seeing you. I got to pick on you just a little bit. No, hold on. I made you an alcoholic for, yeah. know, for about 12 seconds or something. <laughs> <My day. laughs> I'll pick on you when you're gone. You're going to be the one that has all the problems in the future. Yeah. But we've only got 10 minutes, so it's something. Uh, the side effects of uh, the, the older antipsychotics Parkinsonism, uh, tremor muscle stiffness, slow movement, drooling, which is always attractive. Generally occurs beyond uh, one week after starting the medication. Uh, sometimes they put them into park, uh, Parkinsonianism. Uh, sometimes they had tardive dyskinesia. 
Uh, spastic facial distortions and tongue movements uh, may extend to the neck, the trunk, and the extremities. Usually it doesn't. Usually it's just the face. Uh, delayed effect, usually beyond six months uh, from starting the, the medication. So you never know if anybody is going to have dart tardive dyskinesia until about six months after you start them on their antipsychotics. Everything looks fine, then all of a sudden they get this thing where they can't control their tongue and it's constantly sticking out of their mouths like Harry Potter, that one guy in Harry Potter who kept acting like he was a snake. Uh, risk increases with duration of exposure to antipsychotic, uh, in, in, in any antipsychotics. It's known to occur without antipsychotic therapy, but not very, it's not very common. Uh, it may be permanent, uh, it may be, uh, occur in discontinuous, or, or it may resolve itself uh, over time. Uh, neuroleptic malignant uh, syndrome, uh, pipe-like rigidity, uh, fever, tremor, altered level of consciousness, uh, hypotension uh, where the individual has, their heart is beating very rapidly, but they have low blood pressure, as strange as that may seem. The mortality rate, if you have this reaction, is between, between 10 and 20 percent. So sometimes when you give somebody a medication, it will kick them into a neuroleptic malignant syndrome and they die. You just kill this person trying to treat them for schizophrenia. Um, of course, we don't use the older antipsychotics as much as we used to, only with individuals that aren't sensitive to the, uh, the, the less uh, toxic uh, antipsychotics. Anticholinergic effects, uh, dry mouth, blurred vision, constipation, urinary retention, and dilated pupils, which is always fun. Uh, so the ant older antipsychotics, uh, chlorpromazine, also, also, also known as thorazine, uh, prole pro prolixine, haldol, you probably have heard of haldol or halperidol, uh, loxetane, uh, syrintil, moban, uh, tri trilaphon, uh, ORAP, uh, Melaril is uh, relatively common and fairly highly used, uh, Navane and Stelazine. And uh, of course, sometimes we hit the individual with the older antipsychotics before we hit them with the atypical antipsychotics, which don't always work. But then again, these don't always work either. The newer antipsychotics, uh, Clozapine was introduced in 1990. Uh, Risperidone, uh, very common, uh, was uh, developed in 1994. Olanzapine, uh, quitapine, uh, zepracidone, uh, aripap... I, I, I practiced saying this before I came to class. Aripiprazole, aripiprazole. There's that, that lady that's getting married. What's it? Her Pippa, Pippa, her name's Pippa Middleton. It's uh, Kate Middleton's sister, the one with, well, we won't talk about her, with Fanny, but uh, she's the one that, that uh, was the hit of, uh, of Kate's wedding because of her tight dress. Anyway, Pippa is her name. Or Eric Pipprazol. ADA and APA a consensus report on obesity and diabetes uh, in those taking antipsychotics. And this was a really uh, interesting thing that happened in two, 2004. Uh, the biggest problem was they were not only making these people fat, but they were also kicking them into diabetes just by treating them, uh, the medications. So they, were tr they have been trying to come up with a medication that doesn't cause uh, obesity and, of course, doesn't kick the person into diabetes. Uh, they were treating their, their schizophrenia and they were dying from diabetes, which is not a happy medium. Uh, atypical antipsychotics are also called second generation antipsychotics and serotonin dopamine antagonists. Uh, the mechanism, it adds serotonin activity uh, to the antipsychotic, uh, so it makes them feel better. Uh, it binds more loosely to the dopamine receptors. Uh, clozapine initially rejected as an antipsychotic because of its seemingly reduced dopamine impact. And of course we had that theory that dopamine was a cause of psychosis, and therefore one of the things that uh, happened was we had a drug that really didn't work on dopamine as well as the others, but it still worked as an antipsychotic. 
So they actually rejected it because of its dopamine impact. It wasn't as great as they wanted to see. But now we know that clozapine, of course, works. Indications in use of schizophrenia and other psychotic disorders, acute bipolar uh, mania and maintenance, augmentation of antidepressants and mood stabilizers, and aggression and impulsivity, it controls those as well. Uh, so we can use these antipsychotics not only to treat psychosis, schizophrenia and bipolar disorder, but we can also use, use them to treat ant, uh, uh, depression, especially really serious depression that doesn't seem to be controlled. Uh, features, uh, it's, there's less of a risk of uh, movement disorders, uh, greater effect on negative symptoms of schizophrenia. Uh, there's also a greater risk of, of obesity and diabetes and lipid abnormalities. Now the lipid abnormalities that we're talking about are increased triglyceride and LDL levels. This is not a good idea. This is really not a good idea because these individuals were treating their schizophrenia, they're acting relatively normal, but we're raising their, their lipid levels to the, the point that they have heart attacks and die. Well, wait a minute. So what's better, having schizophrenia uh, symptoms or controlling the schizophrenia and killing them in five or 10 years because you've raised their lipid levels so high? So this is a question that everybody has to ask. You know, it's one of those toss-ups. How do you want to die, I guess, is, is one of the questions that they have to ask themselves. And of course, these are the drugs that are the newer antipsychotics. It requires regular monitoring of metabolic parameters, potential stroke mortality, uh, risk in the elderly, of course, because they already aren't metabolizing things as well as the others. Uh, and of course, it can give you ataxia, uh, movement disorders, where you have Parkinsonian symptoms. Uh, the neuroantipsychotics of Vilify, you probably saw this one on television. Uh, it can be either activating or sedating. Uh, it causes uh, nausea, which is always fun. Uh, Clozaril, you may have heard of this one as well. Uh, it's most effective antipsychotic. Uh, at risk of agranulocytosis. Agranulocytosis has to do with uh, having too many uh, neutrophils in your blood. It's a white blood cell. You have to have a CBC done every six weeks. Uh, there are multiple side effects. Uh, <laughs> it, it doesn't work if you smoke. Now remember, one of the interesting things about uh, somebody that's schizophrenic is that they're chain smokers. And that's because it raises their dopamine level. It takes care of all those excess dopamine receptor sites. Clozaril really works very, very well. But you can't smoke. So what they try to do is not treat somebody that has that they've uh, treated with something else. They try to use Clozaril first because if they have become a chain smoker like most schizophrenics, it's going to reduce the effect of, uh, of the Clozaril. It's just fascinating stuff. Then we have the olanzapine, uh, significant weight, diabetes, and lipid abnormalities, of course, and it's also reduced by smoking. So these are the atypical antipsychotics. It is time to stop. I thank you all. I had a great time. I love this class. You guys were great. I had a fantastic time. Uh, of course, Johnny was always the one with the sense of liver. So <laughs> uh, anyway, so it's 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 a fun class. I appreciate all of your attention. Uh, I know that I preach sometimes. I will try not to do that in the future. No. Yes, I will.